Assalamu'alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Many of us kill bacteria practically every day. We kill them when we clean our hands, either by using soap or now more and more this alcohol-based gel hand sanitizer. We also kill them when we consume antibiotic, whether we actually need them or not. The point is that we tend to treat bacteria as enemies because we think they are bad. Now, hopefully, that thinking will change in the next one hour or so. Our special guest, Dr. Sir Richard J. Roberts, will tell us that bacteria is not necessarily bad, that we actually need quite a few of them, and that we should actually love them. Now, this won't be the first time that Dr. Roberts will try to change the way people think. In fact, if you look through his biography, you will see a solid track record of challenging conventional wisdom discovering new things, shifting paradigms. Most notably, as already mentioned by the promoter, his discoveries of split genes, mRNA splicing, that completely changed the way biologists thought about genes and lead to radical progress in many fields of research, including cancer research. And for that outstanding achievement, Dr. Sir Richard J. Roberts has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1993. Now, even though he has already achieved, he has already received the highest award any scientist can dream of, the Nobel Prize, he doesn't stop, rest, and enjoy. Instead, on the contrary, he continues to be scientifically productive, if you see in his biography, after the Nobel Prize, he received so many other awards, including he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II of England. And today, he is the Chief Scientific Officer of New England BioLab, where he continues to direct and lead groundbreaking works, cutting edge science. So we are very fortunate to have him here today so that we can have this important dialogue, important conversations on why we should love bacteria. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sir Richard J. Roberts. Great pleasure to be here. Distinguished colleagues, other colleagues, students, friends. It's a great honor for me to be here. It's always a delight to talk to you about bacteria. I love bacteria. I do everything I can to make everybody else love bacteria. And so, during the course of this talk, I will hope to convince you that these should be your friends, that these should be bacteria that you really appreciate, that you love, and you don't feel you have to go and wash your hands every time you touch anything. Ha I changed the, yeah. So I'm going to start off by talking, is this working? Yeah. I'm going to start off by talking about where bacteria stand within the tree of life, I will do a fairly broad spread of where we find bacteria in the earth, and then I will move into humans and talk about the bacteria that live with us. I will explain why they have received such a bad name, and then I will tell you 
why they really do not deserve the bad name that they have received. Now if we look at wall, if we look at the tree of life, on the top left you can see there is a, a big branch that are the bacteria. Those are the most primitive forms of life that we know about, um, of organisms that are actually truly alive. To the right of that are archaea. For a long time they were confused with bacteria, um, but they are in fact quite different. They have some very different properties. They typically live in very harsh environments, at high temperatures, at very low temperatures, in highly saline environments, and they have a lifestyle that is somewhat different. And in fact, they are probably quite close to some of the original forms of life that appeared on Earth. Down at the bottom are the eukarya. The eukarya are the eukaryotic organisms, which are all the organisms that you typically think of as life. When we go and walk around outside, we see trees, we see plants and flowers, we see animals, we see ourselves, we see dogs and cats. These are all the eukaryotic organisms. And you might wonder that these were perhaps the dominant form of life on Earth, but in fact, they amount for about 40% of the total biomass on Earth. The vast majority of this biomass are the bacteria and the archaea and organisms that are microscopic that you cannot see unless you have a microscope. These organisms live with us. They live with every animal, with every plant. They live in the soil. If I dig three miles down into the earth, we find bacteria living there perfectly happily. You go in the oceans, the oceans are full of bacteria. You go to the sea floor and you discover huge bacterial mats living down there. Bacteria are everywhere and yet we know relatively little about them. As is often the case with things that you can't immediately see, we have not studied them as much as we should. We tend as biologists, as scientists, to investigate the macro side of life, things that we can see. It's been very easy for Darwin and naturalists and so on to go off and see the animals and to see finches and birds and so on. And this tended to be what was studied. The bacteria on this tree... Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. The bacteria on this tree of life occupy quite a, a large area on the left, at the top left, but I would draw your attention, if this works, does this work? No. Okay. Can't do it. Okay, so let's look down at the eukarya. If you go to the left, the bottom left, and you can see zea, the three words, Z-E-A. This is maize, this is a plant. And right next to it are humans, homo. The length of the line connecting homo to zea we go back and back. This tells you how far apart we are in an evolutionary sense. If you go from the bacteria all the way down the tree to get to man, there's a huge difference, huge distance. We're a long way apart. But it may surprise you to know that you and I are full of bacteria. And if we kill all of our bacteria, we die. Without them, we simply cannot survive. We need them. And this is true for most of the organisms living on Earth. If we kill the bacteria, they will die. This is something that's worth considering when you start to take antibiotics and when you start to kill the bacteria that are normally living with you. Now, what I want to do is just quickly to go through one or two of the organisms that are so essential and have played such an enormous role in this planet. I start with a cyanobacterium, Anabena St. John's. This organism is exceedingly old. It's one of the oldest bacteria that we know about. And it had the unfortunate property when it started out 
of finding itself in an anaerobic environment, an environment in which there was no oxygen. All of the oxygen was tied up. It was in chemical compounds of one sort and another. Anabina um, was ha quite happy to grow this way, uh, but in so doing, in, in doing its thing, it slowly hydrolyzed the, band, the bonds that connected the oxygen to, say, metals or hydrogen or whatever it was bound to, and released it into the atmosphere in much the way that we today are releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. And what happened to Anabina? Well, it almost wiped itself out of existence. Because it had to learn how to adapt, it polluted its environment, and most of these organisms were not able to grow. And a few of them figured out how to change so that they could live in an oxygenated environment, even though they preferred an environment with no oxygen. And so they were able to survive, but in very small numbers. There are not large numbers of these around. They don't form a particularly high part portion of life at the moment. We are in danger of doing the same thing. Um, because of what we're doing to our environment and to our climate, if we're not careful, we will suffer the fate of the anabina and almost pollute ourselves out of existence. These are bacteria that I think are particularly beautiful. These are mixobacteria. These are bacteria that are responsible for rotting wood. If you go into a forest, a tree falls down, and very soon these trees are colonized by mixobacteria. Now, the mixobacteria are quite complicated as bacteria go because they can actually form little fruiting bodies that look much like mushrooms, and they're shown on the next slide, I hope. Okay, so this is a little fruiting body of a mix of bacteria. They produce spores, they spread the spores around the forest, and in this way, when the next tree falls down, the spores are there, ready to start eating it. So these organisms, which you almost never see, really play a tremendous role in recycling the wood from fallen trees uh, and from other kinds of plants that one finds dying in the forests. This is an example of a spiral bacterium. Um, we're just showing a part of it here, but it actually spirals around. And I want to draw your attention to this particular organism because there are many hundreds of different types of spiral bacteria out there, and these were some of the very first that were ever seen in a microscope. If you look in the middle of this cell, you see a big black line. This is actually a magnet. It's iron, hematite. It senses the Earth's magnetic field, and this bacterium uses it in order to know whether to swim north or south. If it lives in the southern oceans, it swims south. In the northern oceans, it swims north. And this helps it to find food. Very sophisticated bacterium that is really just a little magnet. It's not very responsive, this. There are many extreme environments on this Earth. Some of them you know about very well here on Java. You look around the center of the island, and you have this constant range of volcanoes, which makes it very nice to fly past the island. But nevertheless, these volcanoes cause some problems. But volcanoes are not limited to land. They also occur in the oceans. And in the oceans, we think of them, when they erupt, as steamers, black steamers, thermal vents, and they have some very interesting life that becomes associated with them. They pour magma out, together with hydrogen sulfide and many other noxious gases, many minerals, and form these big black smoking chimneys that we call vents. Uh, the temperature of these vents at the site of eruption is about 300 degrees centigrade. But because the ocean itself is maybe four or five degrees centigrade, there is a thermal climb that takes place, vast change in temperature, 
and it is in this region where life grows. And if you look on the right hand side here, you can see some white and red organisms. Here's a close up on them. These are tube worms. These are true eukaryotic organisms. They, they are worms in one sense, but they cannot live without the bacteria that live within them. In fact, the worm is just a big case for bacteria that are living off the hydrogen sulfide that is coming out of the vent. They use the breakdown of that hydrogen sulfide to generate the energy that they need in order to grow. These worms produce larvae. The larvae are swimming around in the oceans because the vents don't last for very long. Maybe they're active for three months or six months or a couple of years, but they're not active forever. And so these organisms need, in order to survive, to go and find new ones as they appear. And when a new vent appears, within a matter of a week or two, they're colonized by these organisms, and so now we get these colonies going again. And there are many other organisms that grow there, uh, but these are particularly interesting to me because of the large number of bacteria that they need for their life. Now, for any of you who have been to the US, and I suspect for those of you who have been out into the environment near the volcanoes here, you're familiar with these geothermal areas um, that are particularly beautiful to go and visit. And one of those in the US is Yellowstone National Park. It was the very first national park in the US. It is an absolutely fascinating place. It's a volcanic caldera, and the life that lives there, the geothermal activity there, is quite extraordinary. It is one of the most beautiful areas in the world, and if you get the chance, I would absolutely encourage you to go and visit it. But I want here to point out these areas there's a green band. We're looking actually at a, a spring, a geothermal spring. Um, typically, the temperature will be between 70 and 90 degrees. In the slightly to the left of the middle is this green band. These are photosynthetic bacteria um, that are living off the CO2. They're harvesting the light. They're getting the energy from light, but they're also getting some energy from metabolism and from the heat from the spring. On the right-hand side. You have some brown and orange. These are also photosynthetic bacteria that are living in these very high temperatures. And one of the things that is very nice about these organisms is that they have very many interesting enzymes in them that find use commercially. And so this has been a very profitable group of organisms to go looking at in order to find commercially industrial use enzymes. You probably um, could do something similar here in Indonesia by looking at the pools and the organisms living near the volcanoes um, that are growing at very high temperatures. I'm sure they have interesting properties too. One other thing that happens in Yellowstone is that because of the high concentration of hydrogen sulfide that is coming out of the ground, there are organisms called sulfur lobus that will convert the hydrogen sulfide into elemental sulfur, and you get these huge yellow sulfur pools all over the place. Um, these look very inhospitable. They smell terribly if you go there. Um, but these organisms, sulfur lobas, loves them. They think this is heaven to them, uh, and they grow perfectly happily there. And again, they grow at high temperature. Now, what I want to do is to switch gears a little bit and to talk about humans and bacteria. Now, one of the things that we tend to think about and have thought about for much of, of the life of the biological scientists is that humans are humans. The human genome determines our fate tells us what we're going to be, whether we're male or female, short, tall, and so on. And when the Human Genome Project was conceived, the only target was the human genome, the genome, the DNA that was in human cells. However, we forgot at that time to consider the possibility that the bacteria that live with us were also a part of the human genome. We forgot that we couldn't kill all of these bacteria and still survive. 
And so the bacteria and the human genome are really a very important symbiosis. These are organisms that live together. And some of the statistics are shown on this slide. So if I look at a typical human and ask how many human cells do you have, the answer is about 10 to the 13. It's a goodly number of cells. But then I can ask how many bacterial cells live with this typical human? And the answer is somewhere between 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14 bacterial cells. That's between the same or 10 times as many. We don't usually know that number terribly accurately. Now, among all of these cells, you can ask, well, how many strains are there? Well, for human, of course, we're just one. There's just us. But for the bacteria, the best estimates are that there is a minimum of 20,000 different strains of bacteria that live with any one of us. Not just a few, 20,000, maybe as many as 50,000. The numbers are enormous. And they live all over us, all over our skin, in our hair, under our armpits, in our guts. Everywhere we look, we find bacteria. When we ask how much DNA, in terms of the length of DNA, is encoded within a typical human, well, there's about 3 times 10 to the 9 DNA bases, and there's an equivalent or perhaps 10 times as much bacterial DNA. A bacterial genome is typically about 3 million bases, whereas the human is 3 billion bases. So there's, there's a lot of DNA that is present that is bacterial DNA that lives with us. And thanks to my discovery, we know that human DNA actually doesn't have that many genes, because in humans, the genes are really spread out over large distances, whereas in bacteria, they're very compact. They do not have these introns that I discovered that are present in higher organisms. And so the number of bacterial genes just dwarfs the number of human genes. And our best guess is that maybe there's about 23,000 human genes, that is genes that code for proteins, that make us work, that carry out all of our activities. But for bacteria, a million, maybe two million, maybe three million, many, many more genes. And one of the sad things about biology at the moment, or one of the very good things is that we don't know a great deal about these bacterial genes. And this means that on the one hand, we need to find out more so that we can understand the interactions between the bacteria and us. We need to understand how the bacteria work, which means we have to figure out what these genes are doing. And so if you're a young person in the audience, I would say here is a wonderful area to do some research. We need to find both better methods for working out what these genes are doing, and we also need to put a lot of manpower and a lot of thought into being creative so that we can really understand how the bacteria work, how they interact with one another, and how they interact with us. Because one of the things we know is that most of these bacteria are not pathogens. They're not dangerous. They are looking after us. And I always like to tell everybody the way to think about this is to think at your home. When you buy a house, one of the first things you do is you put a fence around it. And you try to keep thieves and, and people out who you don't want. And you put an alarm system in so that if a thief tries to get into your house, an alarm sounds and the police can come and get rid of them. Bacteria do the same thing. They have made us their home. We are their home. They don't want anything to happen to us. They're not interested in us getting ill, in causing problems. No, they would like us to live as long as possible so that we provide them with a good home. And in this way, they do a tremendous amount of good because they surveil our bodies. They look to see where the bad guys are and they have developed methods to kill pathogens. 
They even have developed methods to kill cancer cells. Bacteria don't like us to get cancer because it just means we end up dying and we destroy their home. And so we're just now starting to learn about some of the very clever ways in which bacteria are protecting us against disease. This is an early phase in this, probably only within the last five to ten years that there has been some realization of just how valuable all of this is. And it's an area that would just be wonderful to get into. So for the young people in the audience, think about these bacteria. And it's not just humans. Bacteria help every animal on Earth. They help the soil, they help plants. There are so many areas open for research here. Now this is just a quick rundown of some of the variety of organisms that typically live in humans. It's not intended as an exhaustive list, but just to give you some idea um, that if I look on your skin or if I look in your gut or your mouth, we find very different organisms living there. I like to show this photograph because most people not only have never seen it, but never consider it. One of the way in which we spread bacteria from one place to another is by sneezing. And some bacteria have figured out that this is actually a good way to allow them to spread, and so they make us sneeze. And an unstifled sneeze, one in which we you know, just let the, the um, sneeze come out and you take a high-speed photograph of it and you see these micro droplets which you don't normally see and if you're healthy it's probably not much of a problem but if you're sick this is a problem and so Kleenex and handkerchiefs are a very good thing if you're sick to stop the spread of bacteria now this slide this table really summarizes why bacteria got a bad name because what happened, starting in the mid-19th century, the biologists, having access to microscopes, having access to um, culture media, being able to grow some of these bacteria, they started to study the bacteria that caused disease. And there was a very good reason to do this, because at the time, average life expectancy was not very high. Um, if you lived to be 35 or 40, um, you were thought to be doing very well. When Mozart was my age, um, he'd been dead for 50 years. People did not live very long in those days, and it was because of infectious diseases, because of the effect of pathogens. And slowly, the microbiologists worked on individual diseases to work out which bacteria were causing the problems or whether it was viruses causing the problems, but they were more difficult to deal with, and so there was a big focus on um, bacteria. And so the microbiologist became so obsessed with the bacteria that caused disease, and this was all they talked about, and this was all that you heard about on radio or in newspapers and later on television. Uh, oh, we've just found a cure for this disease. We found out what causes this. And then along came antibiotics um, after the sulfur drugs, and so now we were able to combat disease. But you heard nothing about the good bacteria. And it's a little surprising, because I would ask you, knowing how many bacteria they are that live with us, would you not expect that if all of those bacteria were bad, we would have no chance of living. You know, you can't live with 10 bad bacterial cells for every human cells. And so we should have thought, well, in addition to these bad ones, there have got to be some good ones there. But no one thought about that. No one looked into it. Occasionally, someone would grow one of these, and it wasn't a pathogen, and so they tended to ignore it. They didn't study it. They didn't wonder what was going on. We now know that the vast majority, maybe 99.99% of all the bacteria that live with us, they're good for us. They're actually protecting us against all these bad guys that they were busy discovering in the most of the 20th century. I just want to take you through one or two of the 
bad ones, just to give you a flavor of what went on. And the one I like best of all, it's a personal preference because it turns out I've done a lot of work on this organism uh, because they turn out to have a lot of restriction enzymes and DNA methylases in them, which I, I'm very interested in. But Helicobacter pylori is an organism. It lives in your stomach. Um, virtually nothing else lives in your stomach because of the acidic pH. But Helicobacter pylori can tolerate that. It forms colonies on the epithelium, the skin that surrounds the stomach, and it causes ulcers. Now, for the longest time, everybody thought ulcers were caused by too much acid. And the pharmaceutical companies thought this was great because they could sell you antacids. Antacids do something for the symptoms, but they do nothing for the cause. And so if you had an ulcer, you had to keep taking antacids day after day after day, which is what the pharmaceutical companies love. They, they don't like things that cure disease because you take them for a few days and then you don't have to take them anymore. But if you have to buy them every week, they think this is great. Well, there were two Australian microbiologists, actually doctors, um, called Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, and they started to look at the intestinal contents, at the stomach contents from people who had ulcers, and they noticed these funny little bacteria there. And they wondered, could it be that it is these bacteria that cause the ulcers and not the acid? And so in a very classic experiment, Barry Marshall isolated this organism, grew it in the lab, and took a drink of it. And sure enough, within a few days, he developed an ulcer. He then took an antibiotic, it killed the helicobacter, and cured his ulcer. Here is a classic piece of experimental science that many scientists over the years have done to prove their hypothesis. When everybody else doesn't believe it, and they do the experiment and show how it works. For this work, Marshall and Warren won the Nobel Prize um, for the discovery that Helicobacter caused ulcers. Now, Helicobacter causes other things too. It can also cause cancer. It's one of the few bacteria we know about that can actively cause cancer, and this happens when you have a particularly bad infection that doesn't get treated. The Helicobacter makes its way into the cells, the human cells, around the epithelium. We don't exactly know how it does it, but it can make those cells cancerous and can cause stomach cancer. And if, as a result of refluxing the stomach contents up into the esophagus, then it can also cause esophageal cancer. But life is not all bad, because it turns out that Helicobacter, um, if it's not just a mild infection, looks as though it protects us from a disease called asthma. If you go to the developing world, where almost everybody has helicobacter infections, asthma is an unknown disease. You go to the West, where very few people have helicobacter infections because they've been taking so many antibiotics, they almost never have, they almost always rather have asthma. Asthma is very, very common in the Western world. And we think it is a, a disease that is caused because we've been interfering with the microbes in our bodies in ways that are inappropriate. So Helicobacter is a complicated organism, uh, but maybe we could fix it. Maybe with a little biotechnology, a little genetic modification, we could change it so that we could capture the beneficial properties and get rid of the properties we don't want. We don't know if that's possible yet, though. This is a, an interesting disease. I particularly like the organism that causes it, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, Lyme disease is a disease that there is a lot of in the area in New England where I come. It's caused by a, a deer tick bites you and transfers a bacterium into you. On the right-hand side, you see this characteristic red ring that characterizes the point where the, the tick bit you and where the cause of Lyme disease um, got in. If you treat it immediately with antibiotics, you have no problem. However, if you don't, then you end up with 
an infection by this organism, Borrelia, or another spiral organism, but I think it, it looks quite pretty in this slide. But it will get into your nervous system, it gets into the spinal cord, gets into the brain, and can cause some major problems. Once that happens, it is very difficult to get rid of it. It may be a two or three year treatment with specialized antibiotics um, that are delivered in not necessarily the nicest fashion. You don't just drink them. You can eventually get rid of it, but it can cause a lot of nervous damage in the meantime. So it's not such a nice fellow. I like Vibrio cholera. Vibrio is a lovely organism. Vibrio likes to live in the oceans. It doesn't like to do anything other than hang out in the oceans where it doesn't cause a lot of problems. When it causes problems is when it gets into the drinking water and humans start to drink Vibrio cholera and then it causes the disease of the same name called cholera. That's a disease that you can get over, you can cure it by taking antibiotics and by drinking very large amounts of water. Uh, basically what it does, it causes you to dehydrate incredibly rapidly. And this is a disease that is very prominent in many areas, I suspect um, in Indonesia from time to time, in Bangladesh they have major problems with it. And it's because you have very low lying land, and the seawater, you have a, a big tide, you have a storm comes through, the seawater gets into the drinking water and causes a problem. But there is a wonderful um, remedy, a wonderful way of stopping cholera, and that is thanks to the um, dress sense of many of our ladies. If you go to Bangladesh, you find the saris that the ladies wear are very finely woven, beautiful saris, and I, I think I can see some similar kinds of very beautiful white, fine silk um, dresses here. If you take water that is contaminated with cholera and just filter it through the sari, you get rid of most of the Vibrio cholera. And that's not because it filters out the Vibrio cholera, but because it filters out this large orange blob here, which is another organism, a eukaryotic organism called Volvox. Vibrio cholera likes to bind to Volvox. And so the free concentration of Vibrio cholera is not very high, but if you don't filter the water, you get both, and so you get it in both ways. Um, but filtering the water can make a huge difference. So my recommendation to all of the ladies is you should go out and buy the very best silk and wear the very best silk that you can, just in case you run into some contaminated water. This is Clostridium botulinum. I think there are many ladies who know about um, Botox. Um, this is the toxin from Clostridium botulinum. This is a nasty uh, disease to get. You really don't want to get it. Um, but the toxin, if you inject it into the lips in appropriate levels, you can make the lips look much larger, which for some reason many ladies think this seems to make them much more attractive. Um, Personally, I like them the way nature produces them, uh, but there are many ladies who feel differently. Typhus is a, a nasty disease that was absolutely devastating in World War I. We had no way of dealing with it, and now we can deal with it with antibiotics very easily. Uh, but the thing about typhus is it's caused by rickettsia, and rickettsia are bacteria that actually grow inside human cells. And so this is um, another kind of lifestyle. It turns out there are many bacteria, hundreds of them, that grow inside human cells. They don't grow freely by themselves. Treponema denticola, another spiral bacterium. This you find in your mouth. And this one is not particularly harmful. Most of the bacteria that live in your mouth, we don't know what they do. Um, we've sequenced them, but, but we don't know what they do. Some we know produce caries and rot your teeth, but many of them are intimately involved in the initial digestion of the food that we eat. The last one I want to talk about is Yersinia pestis. This is the organism that caused the plague in the Middle Ages in Europe that decimated the population. Um, it is a highly transmissible organism. It's transmitted via fleas from rats. 
Um, in the Middle Ages in Europe, they had major problems with rats and fleas, and, and this organism spread very rapidly. It is still quite widespread. There are many parts of the world where this organism is still there, easy to treat with antibiotics, uh, provided you catch it early, but you don't have so long. You really have to catch it within maybe six to eight days of being bitten, and then you can cure it, and it's okay. And so it's only when people come from an area where um, plague is rife, and the doctors know about it, and go, say, to a city where they've never seen it, uh, and then they don't often diagnose it properly. Um, this is what it does to your fingers. It basically necroses the fingers, and you don't, you don't survive too long. It, it, it not, it's not a nice disease. That's the organism that causes it. So now I want to switch gears completely. So I've given you some idea of why bacteria have gotten such a bad name, because of the microbiologists studying disease. I've shown you many of the organisms that cause disease. And so one has to wonder, why are we not all sick from bacterial infections all the time with so many nasty bacteria around? And the answer is because the vast majority of the bacteria that live with us protect us. They're helping us. They're good for us. And they stop all of these nasty guys from growing. We think of them as probiotics, although that's a very, uh, not the best term, I think. There are a couple, Lactobacillus bifidobacteria. These are organisms that are present in yogurt. Um, they're very good for you. They produce um, lots of good materials, good compounds. They help you digest your food. Uh, and they are generally very beneficial. Um, it's a good thing to eat yogurt. Personally, I don't like it, but many people do. It's a good thing to do. Helicobacter, I mentioned already, can have both good and bad effects. The question is, what else is out there? This is just uh, uh, the yogurt pushing the yogurt. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Lactobacillus sarcae. Now, Lactobacillus sarcae is an organism that is present in yogurt, and it's one that the Nestle company in Switzerland, when they bought Dan and yogurt, they started to work on this organism. And they discovered that it was possible to actually improve the health properties of this bacterium. So by introducing some new genes into them, they could make this a much better probiotic than the natural one. But then what happened, the people in Switzerland were very scared about GMOs. And they were told that any genetically mod modified organisms are really bad. And Nestle's got worried. And they said, well, maybe they will have, will have major problems with consumers if we start to genetically engineer the yogurt. Even though we can make it better, they were worried they would get into trouble with it, and so they stopped. They absolutely stopped research in this area, which is a great shame because it is one of many problems that have been caused by the anti-GMO activists. You'll notice, especially if you're diabetic, that you take human insulin every day. Human insulin comes from genetically modified bacteria. And we figured out how to make human insulin in bacteria or in yeast. We can do it too. These are GMOs, but you don't hear the activists arguing against this. Why? Because it's a medicine. Because it produces something that clearly has beneficial effects. And yet it's a GMO. This I find to be a major problem, and I will return to that after the next slide. But I first want to just talk a little bit about Clostridium difficile, C. diff, it's called. If you go to a hospital in the US and you stay there for more than about a week, there's a very good chance you will come up with a C. diff infection. It's rampant in the hospitals, spreads very easily, and it is a nasty organism. Basically, it causes uncontrollable diarrhea doesn't kill you. But for many people, many strains of C. diff, there is no cure 
using traditional antibiotics. Every antibiotic fails. This organism has picked up the most immense resistance to antibiotics. However, it turns out there is a way to cure it. And the way to cure it is to take gut bacteria, which normally one gets by um, taking fecal samples, because these are a good example of what's in a normal um, gut, isolating the bacteria and then feeding it to people with C. diff infections. And in 95% of the cases, it cures them. We don't know how it does it. We don't know what the mechanism is. We don't know which organisms are really responsible for this. But it's a wonderful example of how our normal bacteria are keeping pathogens at bay. And one has to ask, with an example like this, how many other pathogens could we treat the same way? Well, we know that in the nasal mucosa, in many people, there are organisms growing in the nose which will kill Staphylococcus aureus and will kill MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, the most dangerous Staph aureus out there. We don't know how they do it. We don't know which organisms it is, but there's a lot of research in this area. And I think what this is telling us is that there are the most amazing opportunities for research here. Because you go from one population to another, and the bugs that live with us, the bacteria living with us, tend to be a little bit different. They depend very much on your diet. They depend on your lifestyle. If I take a, a typical inhabitant from China and compare them with someone from Indonesia, we will find that their microbiota, the microorganisms, are somewhat different. And so the question is, are there microorganisms growing in the Indonesian population um, that would be particularly beneficial for fighting disease? And vice versa, in the Chinese, or in the Indians, or in the US, or in Europe. Um, people are very different, the microbiomes are very different. And it's a wonderful area for research here. So again, I address the students. If you want to do some really important research that may lead to some key discoveries, this is a great area to be doing it in. Now I'm going to switch gears completely. Let's forget about that for the moment. Oh. I'm trying to get to the last slide. Oh, okay. So I want to finish by making a plea for genetically modified organisms. I, also, I already mentioned that um, we genetically modify bacteria to make human insulin, which is very good. We could genetically modify lactobacillus to make better probiotics. We have the ability to genetically modify plants, and we have been genetically modifying plants for many times to make them much better um, and in fact, the techniques of genetic modification um, that have been developed in the last 30 years allow you to make very precise changes in these organisms that can be hugely beneficial across all societies. But you're probably aware of the anti-GMO activists who want to tell you that these are really dangerous, that this is a very dangerous thing to be doing despite the fact that for the last 12,000 years, we have been genetically modifying everything. Um, every time a couple has a baby, um, they produce a GMO. Your baby is a GMO, because it's got a mix of genes from the mother and from the father. Genetic modification is not inherently dangerous, and particularly using the modern methods it is especially safe. We take one gene, we know exactly what it is, we can put it into a plant, we can monitor where it goes, we can see the products. Traditional breeding, which the anti-GMO activists will tell you, is perfectly safe. Here, you take a lot of genes. You don't know what they are, you put them into another plant, and you test it basically by eating it. Um, 
And in this way, we have a large number of products on the shelves. Celery is the example I use very often. Celery, if celery were a GMO, you would not be allowed to eat it. Celery has a group of compounds in it called sorolins that can cause cancer. When ladies used to be harvesting celery and chopping it up to put into supermarket packets, many of them came down with contact dermatitis on their hands as a result of touching the celery juice in large quantities, and some even got can skin cancer from it. Okay? Just because of the sorolins, the natural compounds that are present. If this were GMO, it would be banned. But in fact, you can eat celery perfectly safely. It's not a problem. Your body knows how to take care of this. And so all of the scare stories that you hear from the anti-GMO activists, they're scare stories. They're fiction. They're stories designed to make you want not to support GMOs, but rather to support the organizations. And as a result of this, this has been the most incredibly good fundraiser for the anti-GMO organizations. You may be surprised to know that Greenpeace raises about 500 million euros every year, partly because of their anti-GMO campaign. So for them, it's a huge money maker. Well, I, I've been very concerned about this. I organized a campaign. We now have 123 Nobel laureates trying to convince Greenpeace to stop spreading this nonsense. Okay? What they're saying is not scientifically factual. In Donald Trump's words, it would be an alternative fact. But it's just not factual. It's not good science. And so, we want to spread this message as widely as we can. I've organized a campaign. We have a website shown at the bottom, supportprecisionagriculture.org. If you agree with us, you can go to the website, but I should, you should go there anyway, read what we have to say. There's a huge amount of factual information about this. There are links to lectures that people have given about this. Um, all of the evidence in support of GMOs and why they're good and why we need them um, is on this website. And if you agree, join up. There is a place on the website where you can sign on and join us. And we're trying to get as many signatures as we can. We're trying to get the religious leaders around the world to come out and make some positive statements. Because the bottom line is, for much of the developing world, for many of the poor people in this world, we need, they need, GMOs. The big agricultural companies have focused on crops that are good for the West, where there are massive markets. But they've not focused on cassava and on things that are useful, manioc, things that are grown in many local developing countries because there's not a big market. But we can fix all of these. One thing I'm particularly keen on at the moment is something called banana wilt. If you go into sub-Saharan Africa, there is a major disease of bananas underway, caused by a bacterium, unfortunately, Xanthomonas wilt. There is no natural form of banana that can resist it. The only way to stop this disease is to spray chemicals on it. However, there is a very good GM solution. Sweet peppers have two genes in them, which will kill Xanthomonas wilt and will protect it. We can take those two genes and put them into bananas, and that has been done, and it will protect the bananas from Xanthomonas wilt. In Uganda, 30% of all of the calories that the people consume come from bananas. Why would you not put these genes in and protect the crops? Without it, bananas will disappear. Okay? We're, you're just going to lose it. You may think it's nice here, to eat bananas. I noticed we arrived at the airport yesterday. We were given some bananas as a snack. I think we need to protect our bananas. We need bananas, and we need to adopt these GMF, GM methods to make sure we don't lose them. So I'm hoping you all will support me on this campaign. The more people who sign up, the better. But even if you don't sign up, please do read the site and get yourself familiar with the facts. 
And with that, I would thank you. Um, I will be happy to take questions either now or, or whenever the moderators think that it is appropriate. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, what, would you please stay where you are? And now, before we proceed to the question and answer session, uh, Universitas Gajah Mada now will proudly confer the degree of honorary doctor to Sir Roberts. And for that, I can invite the chairman of the Academic Senate, Professor Hardianto Subono, who will put the academic count on uh, Sir Roberts and also the director, Professor Vikorita Karnawati, to hand over the certificate. And now the cert certificate of honorary doctor to Sir Roberts. Silakan Burita. So thank you, thank you very much. Once again, congratulations to Dr. Sir Roberts, PhD. Congratulations once again, and thank you very much for Director and Professor Javianto Subono, the Chair of the Academic Senate of the University. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we proceed to the question answer session. And, uh, Pak Yodi, floor is yours. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, while they're set up for the Q&A, let me just tell you a little bit about how we're going to run it, just the choreography of the sessions. So first, I'm going to invite uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Sir Richard J. Roberts to sit with me here, and I'll pose a couple of opening questions. And then afterward, I will open the floor to the audience. And if you can see, there are three standing microphones, one over there, one in the middle, one over there. So if you have questions, please make your way immediately to the microphone so that we can save time. We will try to entertain as many questions as we can before we run out of time, which would be around 11.25. Yeah? So while we start with the opening questions, please prepare your questions and go to the mic, uh, queue up so that we can get your questions efficiently. Thank you. Roberts. First of all, thank you for that fascinating and inspiring lecture that ran through of the world of bacteria, which was very inspiring. Now, uh, as an opening question, here you see in the audience there are so many young people, and many of them aspire to be the next world-leading scientists, 
perhaps to be Nobel Prize winners like you. So what would be your advice to these young people as the next generations of world scientists? Well, I, I usually tell people the most important thing to do is to work out what it is that you're really passionate about, what you love to do, and make a career of it. And I don't, it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be art, it could be video games, it could be biology, it could be physics. Whatever it is, whatever you really like to do in your spare time, make a career of it. Because you can always find a way to do that. Smart people never have a problem making a career. Don't worry about money. I think one of the things that a lot of young people do is they think they've got to make a lot of money. And I know in many Asian societies, and parents think their children have failed if they don't make a lot of money. It's not true. Money does not bring happiness. You just need enough money to survive. But if you love what you do, the money is irrelevant. You will be successful and everything will go well. And I would draw your attention um, to those of you who think that you should be um, pursuing a career that will give you a Nobel Prize. I wrote an article for the journal PLOS Computational Biology entitled 10 Simple Ways to Win a Nobel Prize. I would recommend you read that. It, it is intended as a humorous article, but there are some words of wisdom in it. Okay, thank you. Now, we are here in Universitas Gajah Mada, and one of our responsibility is to create a vibrant scientific atmosphere so these future leaders can flourish. Now, so what, in your view, what are the key conditions that we need to ensure in this campus to do that? Um, not knowing how you teach at the moment, it is always difficult for me to suggest changes. Um, and so maybe some of the things I say you're already doing. But I think one of the key things that is, is absolutely important in education is to make sure that the kids, the, the young people who are being educated feel that they're a part of the process, feel that they have the opportunity to ask questions and to explore things for themselves and are not just taught to memorize facts and then regurgitate them in an exam. I had an extremely good chemistry professor who taught chemistry as though it was a, a, a puzzle. And the chemistry exams, you never had to just regurgitate anything. All of the chemistry exams were really puzzles that you had to solve while you were doing the exam. And I think this, this method of teaching, where people have the opportunity to explore what they're interested in, to ask questions, to um, get on and do experiments in the lab that they thought of, not ones that some textbook suggested or that a professor um, thought about. This is a very good way to teach. If you go back and think about the time when you were very young, three, four years old, what were you interested in? Well, you were interested in exploring the world. You wanted to go and touch everything and see everything, find out how things worked. And if you were lucky, your parents would encourage that. If you were less lucky, um, your parents would try to stop you from touching some of the things that maybe you wanted to touch. I say go out and touch everything that you can. Um, you never know when you're going to find something that will be just so interesting, it will become a passion for your life. And I would also add a corollary to that, um, which very much applies to my own life. And that is, if you're doing something, let's say you've decided, I want to be a doctor. And so you're pursuing this career as a doctor, and then all of a sudden you come across something that is very different, but you think, gosh, that would be even more interesting and more fun. Don't be afraid to change course. Very often, you learn in one field and find something else that's interesting, so switch. Go and do the other thing. Don't be afraid to switch and do the other thing. Don't be afraid to rebel. Um, I, I've always been a rebel. I always feel if people tell me I should be doing something, 
I usually want to do the opposite because I think it's probably boring. But if people tell me not to do something, I always think there's probably something really interesting worth doing there. And so don't be, don't be too uh, strong in following rules. Do the things that you think are important. Remember that it is the young people in this world who are going to run the world in the future. Okay? It's not the old people. The old people, they run it now, but they're going to disappear, and they often don't know what is best for you. Don't let them tell you what is best for you if you think it's wrong. Thank you. Last question before we open to the audience. You've won the Nobel Prize and so many awards. You've achieved so many things. So what's next? What do you still want to achieve in your lifetime? Well, you know, I love doing research. And so at the moment, I'm working on a process called DNA methylation in bacteria. Um, there is a lot more. This is something that happens to the DNA. It gets chemically modified after it's um, been replicated. There is a lot more of this methylation going on in bacteria than we know um, the, the cause of it. We, don't, we know the reason. We don't know why it's taking place. My gut tells me there is something really interesting going on there, and I want to discover what it is. And, and maybe it's something really big. Maybe it will change the way we think about bacteria completely. But I don't know at this point. And so I'm, I'm studying it, I'm documenting it, I'm trying to think up good experiments to do that will test hypotheses in this area, and I hope I will make a big discovery there. But I can tell you if one of you in this audience made that discovery, I would be equally happy. It, it's a good area, not a lot of people working there, and for me, this is why I do science. I, I look to make discoveries. I want to go where other people haven't been. I want to see things for the first time because this is very exciting. This is a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we can open the floor to the audience. I see already one in the middle. Please say your name and short questions, please. Okay, thank you. My name is Philip. Uh, I'm from S Reform Seminary in Jakarta. Uh, and first of all, I want to congratulate you again, Sir Richard Roberts, for the degrees that has been awarded to you. I have two questions. Well, uh, bear with me. The first one is, in recent decades, the world had faced so many disease, plague, or whatever you call it. We have anthrax, Ebola, cholera, and all, all the uh, viruses. Some says that it occurs as a natural phenomena, but some says that it is produced, they were produced, or at least were engineered by human. Uh, well, engineered by a highly secret facility by highly secret institutions. Well, by your perspective, professors, by the one who look for the truth in microorganisms, in a world, in nanoscales, do you think it's possible? Do you think that this is, can be a, one of the, the plot major global effort to reduce humankind in by 2030. My second question is... Well, why don't I answer that one first? Yeah. No. Short question. Short Very answer. Short answers. <laughs> okay. well, short I question. I kind of hope that you will elaborate it more. Well, well, you know, there is just no credible evidence supporting such a theory. But more to the point, we know that diseases have been around forever, long before we had any ideas of using them in some way and um, conspiring to kill people by this method. They're a natural process. Um, new viruses arise all the time. New bacteria arise all the time. Some of them cause disease, some don't. It's called evolution, and we, we've known about it for many, many years since Charles Darwin formulated his theory and there is just no evidence um, supporting anything else. 
Yeah. So you mentioned about the evolution, Professor. So my second question is, as you already presented that we uh, human comes originated by evolutions and all these bacteria are already intact within, within us to support our lives. But I would like to ask an epistemological question. What is the purpose of all this life? The life supported by this bacteria. Is there any grand designs or meaningful for man? Or is it just coincidence occur by evolutionary process? Well, you know, all of evolution happens by chance. And whatever is fit survives. And so the symbiosis that took place between us and the bacteria that live with us was a pure act of chance. There was no grand design. No one came along and said, we're going to make it this way. It's purely by chance. And I, in my case, I think it was a very happy chance. I, I'm rather glad. But we see this everywhere. It's not just humans and bacteria. All animals have bacteria that live with them. All of the plants and trees have bacteria that live with them. The soil is a mass of bacteria. Bacteria are everywhere, and they form these relationships because they need a home to live in. And if the organism that they choose to make their home is better as a result of it, then that organism will make itself more hospitable to the bacteria. It's a two-way street. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I have Thank to you. give the chance to the others. Thank you, so Professor. We go over there, first one. Yes, uh, please. Yeah. My name is Ryan Rian. Uh, I'm from Agricultural Microbiology, Department of Agriculture. And I want to ask uh, to you, Indonesia has a high biodiversity, uh, especially in microorganism. Uh, we have a hyperthermophilic bacteria, acidophil bacteria, that spread in our environment. And uh, it can use for our prosperity, but unfortunately, Indonesia lack of technology to refill it. And and uh, in the met metagenomic era, like uh, in this era, uh, I think <coughs> biopiracy is a threat for Indonesia. It's a dangerous threat for Indonesia. And I want to ask you how we love bacteria and keep them from biopiracy. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure that I really know enough about this specific case in order to offer advice. But in general, one always finds that bacterial populations come and go. We're getting better and better at identifying problems before they become serious and we're getting better and better at solving those problems when they become serious. Um, I suspect that a close look at this, uh, one could find a suitable solution, but I just don't know enough about this particular instance to be able to offer some specific advice. Okay, thank you. So we go over there. First one, yes. Um, greetings, Sir Roberts. Uh, my name is Arbian Cristianto from Faculty of Law, University of Gajah Mada. And I'm particularly interested in the, uh, in the GMO subjects on these um, particular um, discussions. So I'm enterprising with my uh, startups, agronomy.id, and I also um, enterprising in uh, products uh, of cassava that is very huge because of the results of a GMO also. But one of the obstacles that I'm facing as a, uh, entrepreneurs is that a lot of uh, markets subjects that I'm facing are scared of GMOs. They are lay persons. And because of the scaremongering um, surrounding the GMOs and the anti-GMOs, um, they are afraid that GMOs might cause cancer, GMOs might cause um, deadly diseases, and how do you approach these um, scare laypersons? Is there any catch-all arguments to convince the 
um, the markets that GMO are safe? Thank you. Okay, well, the first thing I would do is I would recommend that you point people to the website that has been put together, um, point out that 123 Nobel laureates um, attest to the safety of the GM method. There is much material on that website that people can read. There are lectures, links to lectures that are available over the internet that point to the safety of this. But the bottom line here is that once people get scared, it is quite difficult to reassure them. And so it takes a lot more effort to reassure people that things are safe than it is to get them scared about the dangers of things. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, our, our campaign is trying to do, is to get people like the Pope, um, like the major religious leaders in this world to speak out and point out the safety of GMOs. And if we could get the Green parties to admit that this is just an area where they made a mistake, that might help too. But the problem with the Green parties is this has been such a successful fundraising event for them that they like the money. And they have not so far shown any willingness to follow the science, accept the science, and accept that they made a mistake. Thank you. But now I we think go the more people who talk about this and the more people who become familiar with the facts, and the easier it will be. There is a very good movie that has been made recently that is not yet being distributed, but soon will be. It's called Food Evolution, and it is a very powerful movie showing how good GMOs can be. And the developing world really needs them. It, it, this is not something that is a, a show the, the developing world really needs them. So that's one movie to wait for. Now, we go to the middle. Yes. Um, hello, Sir Richard. Uh, my name is Hafiz. I'm actually from Faculty of Economics and Business, but I have always had uh, I'm an, an affinity towards science. Well, in this presentation, you talked about how we should love bacteria. Well, I have something bugging uh, my mind, which is um, uh, which you talked about during your slide about Clostridium difficile, which is about anti anti um, antibiotic resistance, in which bacteria is essentially becomes resistant towards um, you know things that can uh, prevent uh, previously kill them. Um, so, how can scientists good use the good bacteria to curb this effect? And is it still possible? And should we worry about um, this anti antibiotic resistance? Um, that's all. Thank you. Sure. So. As far as antibiotic <coughs> resistance goes, and this has all come about because of misuse of antibiotics. Um, we tend to give them when they're going to have no effect. We tend to overuse them. We've made them available, certainly here in Indonesia, over the counter, which was a big mistake. Um, we just need to recognize <coughs> that the antibiotics that we have can still be useful, provided we don't overuse them. Now, when it comes to the C. difficile, kind of result, I think we are going to find that there are many, many, many bacteria that are doing interesting things in our body, in our microbiomes, to stop pathogens from growing. And there is a worldwide effort now um, to start to study these mechanisms to see if we can find out which organisms are doing it, how they do it, and how we can use them. And so I think we are going to find over the course of the next five or ten years that there will be a big change in the way that we treat diseases, both viral, cancer, and bacterial infections. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry, Richard. My name is Leah. I am from Agronomy Department, Faculty of Agriculture. And my question is related with GMO. Uh, when we created GMO and consume GMO <coughs> product, uh, is that the same like we are creating a new kind of organism that totally different with the organism we already know? And will it influence the tree of life? Thank you. Okay, well, I think if you look at what happens during traditional breeding of plants, 
Here, we try to take plants that are very different from one another, but can still form hybrids of some sort. And here we move hundreds of genes from one place to another. That seems to me inherently much more dangerous than taking one gene that we know what it is and putting it into a plant where we think it could be useful and where we can monitor exactly what it does and what has happened. This latter is the GM method of doing things. And any, I, I think any act of logic tells you that that is going to be safer than anything connected with traditional breeding. Will it affect the tree of life? Almost certainly not. Um, when you look at the tree of life, you have to make pretty large changes uh, before you get to plants that, or animals that cannot interbreed. Um, if you look at bacteria, uh, bacteria are constantly changing genetic information, and in fact, it's no longer really clear what is a species of bacterium. And I think we're not doing anything that is inherently dangerous in, in any way whatsoever. Nature has been doing this for many, many millions of years. Um, the way the GM method arose because we just followed what a natural bacterium was doing, agrobacterium was just finding a way to put its genes into a plant. Uh, and we have just used that exact same mechanism. As we sequence more and more genomes of plants and animals, we find bacterial genes everywhere. So there is a lot of transfer of genetic information that takes place naturally. Okay, thank you. We go to that side again. Yes. Thank you, sir. My name is Girang, uh, and I am from the Department of Econom Economics and Business. Uh, sorry, you built about GMO in this presentation. What I am going to access is uh, by doing gene genet genetic modification, we kind of change that the organism that we injecting the modification is. Uh, what I'm asking is, in the long run, this, doesn't it kind of interference in the evolutionary process and it also bring another question. Uh, by mean that how we should human view nature? Should we should we fit nature as we place in expense of another organism? Like by changing the genes or genetic or hybriding like you say like that or we should we should Seek harmony with nature. Thank you. So, so let me make sure I understood what you're asking. Are you asking me, is it ethical to make changes in um, organisms around us? Uh, yeah, kind of that. Okay. So what about dogs? You know, for many thousands of years now, we've been breeding dogs. These are not at all natural products of nature. Um, we've been developing so that they're pets. If you look at almost any form of crop plant that we eat, and you go back and look at their wild relatives, the wild relatives don't look anything like um, the way they do at the moment. So this is not something new. This is something that we've been doing for thousands of years. And we do even more inadvertently. Every time we have an oil spill, we change the ecosystem in major ways. We allow bacteria to recombine and make new organisms that we've not seen before. I think the problem is, it is not possible to have life on Earth, whether it's us, insects, or anything, without changing the way that nature evolves. Evolves, evolution is a natural process. We are part of that process. We're a result of that process. I don't think we're capable of doing anything that is inherently more dangerous than what nature does all by itself. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, in the middle. Hello, sir. My name is Dewi. I'm from Biotechnology Department. I have three questions. The Just first one. one, sorry. One? Just a minute, yeah. Okay. Um, Pick the most important. Yes, the most important is, I uh, want to ask, is it possible to engineer, um, to genetically engineer uh, bacteria to fight um, the pathogens or even cancer? That's all. Thank you. 
So I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We already know that there are some bacteria that produce anti-cancer compounds mm -hmm. and that will stop cancers from growing. There's work coming out of the University of Chicago um, that shows quite clearly that with the right bacteria, um, cancers can be stopped from growing. Can we do it for all cancers at the moment? No. Could we in the future? Maybe we could. Maybe we could persuade bacteria to help us. We are only at the very early stages of learning what bacteria can and can't do for us and how they influence our lives. Um, very early stages. There's a, a massive research area opening up that I think over the next few years we're going to find out that bacteria are way more important than we had ever thought in the past. Okay, thank you. thank you. I think we can take one last one. I'm sorry for the others, but we're almost out of time. So one last one from over there, please. Yes. My name is Firdaus. I am a pharmacy student. And what piques my curiosity is your involvement in this Combrex project. I think everybody in here wants to know how actually we can utilize computer to aid our research in biochemistry and what softwares are being used. Thank you. Okay, so the Combrex project is something that was started a long time ago. Um, we got funding for it for a while. We've had little bits of funding in between, but at the moment we have no funding. And one of the reasons is because the government um, does not understand how important this is. But let me tell you what the Combrex project is. Um, basically, we're finding out the DNA sequences of humans, of pretty much all organisms around a bacteria. It's easy now to get the complete DNA sequence of a bacterium. In time, we are going to know the DNA sequences of every organism that lives on this Earth. And we're going to know about the biology because of our ability to interpret those DNA sequences. And interpreting means that we read the sequence, we identify the genes, and then we predict what protein is going to be made and what that protein will do. This is the area where we're slipping behind, and this is the area that the Combrex project was intended to form, to work out which were the important genes that we need to understand the function of. And for some reason, um, the administrators in NIH in the US, and, and in fact in most funding agencies around the world, don't think this is an important project. And I think they're sadly mistaken, because if we don't do this, and if we don't get going soon, that there will be no point in determining all these sequences because we won't know how to interpret them and we don't, won't know what they mean. And so for me, this is an absolutely crucial project and it's not expensive. And the nice thing about it is it's something that scientists around the world, biologists around the world can participate in. You can have just as big an effect on a project like this in Indonesia as you can in the US or in England or China or wherever you are. I think it's a very important project, and maybe you could start something small here, and if you're interested in doing that, contact me, and I will suggest ways in which you might get started. Okay, I see that there are still many, but unfortunately we're out of time, so uh, I'm sorry that we cannot entertain the rest of the questions. So I would just like to close with a closing question, Dr. Roberts. There are so many researchers here in the room, also watching live streaming, who would love to work with you. But I'm sure it's not possible for you to say yes to all of them or to work with all of them. So tell us the secret. What are you looking for in a collaborator? What makes you say yes to a certain potential collaborator? Well, so, you know, there are two kinds of ways uh, of working with me. One is to come and work in my lab. Um, I don't have any opportunities in my lab at the moment, but I do engage in a large number of collaborations with people in other institutions. And the main collaborations I'm involved with in the moment are people who are sequencing DNA using a new method called Pacific Biosciences Sequencing which gives not just the DNA sequence, but it tells you when the DNA sequence has been modified with these metal groups that I'm interested in. 
And so we are working, I have maybe 100 collaborations going at the moment and with people who send me their data, we analyze it and then try to suggest experiments to find out what is going on and what is worth pursuing. I don't know if there is a Pacific Biosciences machine here in Indonesia somewhere, but if there is, I would love to collaborate with people who are generating bacterial and archaeal DNA sequence data that way. Okay, Dr. Roberts, once again, it's an honor. It's a delight for us to have you as a part of Universitas Gajah Mada, and we're looking forward to collaborate with you in your future projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Sir Roberts, and also Pa Yodi for chairing the beautiful discussions. And my special appreciation to our students with those uh, brilliant and focused questions. Please give a big hand to our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant questions. And now we have come to the end of our first session, and we will now have a break included for a Friday prayer. And for those who will do Friday period, you can do it at Masjid Kampus or at Balai Rung uh, Universitas Gajah Mada. So please, uh, may I remind you to come back here and we will start the second session at 2 p.m. sharp. And the re re registration will open at 1 p.m. Thank you, thank you very much and see you.